To help us understand the events in Turkey, I'm joined now from Washington by Eric Edelman, the former U.S. ambassador to Turkey during the Bush administration, and here in New York by David Phillips, director of the program on peacebuilding and human rights at Columbia University. Uh, uh, Mr. Edelman, I want to start with you. Most people watching TV last night said, oh gosh, there's a coup, but what precipitated this? Why now? Why did it happen? Well, Hari, uh, Turkey is an extremely divided and polarized society. Um, and the uh, former prime minister, now President Tayyip Erdogan, uh, is an enormously polarizing figure. Um, he has been driving the country um, in, in a direction of greater division because of his desire to establish uh, an executive presidency. There's a lot of concern about his autocratic rule. And uh, those divisions, as it turns out, also appear to be mirrored in the, uh, in the military. Uh, and some members of the military obviously yesterday decided to, um, or earlier, but activated yesterday a plan um, to, uh, to take him out of office. David Phillips, this is a long time coming. Uh, his autocratic governance has alienated a large section of the society. When you look at the statement that the military issued, they said they wanted to restore constitutional order. Uh, just recently, Turkey has been attacked by ISIS and suffered significant loss. Their policy in Syria is failing. So it's the accumulation of several years' worth of mismanagement on Erdogan's part. So, Eric Edelman, what does Erdogan do now, considering he knows that there is this dissatisfaction among the public and especially inside the military? Well, he was able yesterday to rally his supporters, uh, which is a big slice of the public, about 50 percent of the public, uh, to come out uh, and uh, stop this coup from succeeding. Uh, I think what you can see happening already uh, is that he's doubling down on some of the things that David was just talking about, the kind of policies that he's followed uh, up to this point. Um, he's purging not only the military, uh, which he's been, uh, had been already doing for some period of time, but uh, he, he's now purging the judiciary. And I think uh, you're going to see a period of some turmoil internally in Turkey while he tries to use this to his advantage to establish uh, what he calls an executive presidency, but which many people fear is really just a, a more authoritarian, personalized regime in Turkey. David Phillips, does this play right into his interests in a way, saying, hey, you know what, look, here's all these bad guys that are trying to get me out of office, trying to ruin what we have as an idea of democracy, and I'm going to need to tighten up things. Uh, he's been warning of a coup for some time. Um, he's not acknowledging the events yesterday. As a coup, he's calling it a terrorist action. Uh, in Erdogan's worldview, he's surrounded by terrorists. The PKK, the Syrian Kurds, civil society in Turkey, the media. He's demonized everybody. And that's part of the polarization that exists in the country. If he practices a kind of victor's justice, purging the military, the judiciary, and potential opponents, then the polarization that Ambassador Edelman talked about is going to become more severe, and Turkey is going to become more unstable. Ambassador Edelman, it's almost impossible to understate the geographic importance of Turkey, considering the fights that the Western world is launching against ISIS and parts of uh, the Syrian government. Yes, I mean, Turkey is a, a, a pivotal uh, country. Uh, it's a NATO ally. Uh, it sits astride uh, several zones of conflict. Of course, it's a, a, a Black Sea literal state. so. It has concerns about its neighbor to the north, Russia, and what's happened in Ukraine, the seizure of and annexation of Crimea. Uh, but it, of course, also is a, a borders Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, so it, it uh, you know, sits astride, uh, you know, an incredibly important zone of conflict and one in which our military forces are currently engaged. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I think what's happened in the U.S.-Turkish relationship is that on, on both sides, there's been an assumption that Turkey is too big, too important to fail. Uh, and as a result, there's been uh, not as much attention, in my view, as should have been paid to some of these domestic uh, Turkish issues that David and I have been talking about with you, Hari. David. Uh, the Erdogan administration adopted a policy called zero problems with neighbors. And within a couple of months, it found itself in conflict with almost all of its neighbors. And those conflicts were really largely of Erdogan's making. Uh, Turkey has historically been a valued member of NATO, but if NATO were being established today because Erdogan's new Turkey is Islamist, anti-democratic, it simply wouldn't qualify for membership. There's also a lot of documentation about Erdogan's support for jihadi groups, 
uh, the jihadi highway that ran from Urfa to Raqqa, provided weapons, money, uh, medical care to wounded warriors coming out of Syria. So Turkey's hardly been a reliable NATO ally member in this fight against violent extremism in the region. So, David, so what, what, what does Erdogan do in this interim period? Because if there are these forces working against him, as he says, or as the, this is a tough neighborhood to live in, uh, how can he placate the interests of the West and figure out a way to keep his neighborhood safe? So Ataturk had a motto, uh, uh, peace at home and peace abroad. Uh, Turkey hasn't been able to realize either uh, under President Erdogan. Right now, there's a moment to pivot, to focus on domestic issues. Instead of cracking down on independent media and civil society, to reactivate the peace process with Turkey's Kurds. Uh, if they're looking for international mediators, there's a history of international involvement discreetly uh, mm -hmm. in this area. So resolving the Kurdish issue would put Turkey back on the right track. Uh, coordinating more closely with the U.S. and the multinational coalition against ISIS would also be a wise move. But Erdogan has hardly displayed good judgment when it comes to critical decisions. You know, he's likely to take this opportunity to consolidate his dictatorship, which would make Turkey less uh, prone to cooperation with the West and less likely to reconcile with its own citizens. Uh, finally, Ambassador Edelman, regardless of what Erdogan does in reaction to this attempted coup, this is still a country that NATO and the U.S. will continue to rely on. Well, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, that's true, Hari. But unfortunately, I have to agree with what uh, David uh, just said. I, one would hope that uh, it would be possible to do the things, uh, and it would be in Turkey's, I think, interest for Erdogan to do the things that David dis, uh, suggested as an agenda post-coup. Post but uh, the early returns suggest that that is not the direction in which he's moving. Um, and I think uh, David's correct. I think we're going to see uh, a, a period of uh, in, internal focus, retribution, um, and uh, a movement away from uh, the kinds of uh, engagement with not only the Kurdish community but the rest of Turkish civil society that might help stabilize the situation. So I think we're in uh, for a period of intensified instability in Turkey and how far it'll go, I, I don't know that anyone can say right now. All right, Eric Edelman, former U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, and David Phillips, Director of the Program on Peacebuilding and Human Rights at Columbia, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.